I'm not making any money talking these days. Good Christ, 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 Christ. <laughs> Dick, folks. I'm not gonna lie to you. Still am. I guess I am a decent guy because I'm a, a, I'm a fucking jerk, uh, and I'm not a jerk. Apparently, I'm a dick. I'm not an awful guy, but I'm just I've done so much ridiculous stuff. Man, I am. Uh, man, I'm an awful guy. Hey, what's happening? Forty year old boy podcast. Mike Schmidt, uh, the host. This week, I'm sitting in. I'm sitting in for whoever usually hosts the show. Uh, there's usually a guy. It was very funny. I got to tell you, folks. I I listen to the show. Uh, I'm going to use a word I don't often use religiously, and it is fantastic. When the regular guys here, I'm just the fill-in guy, so don't get your hopes up. But when the regular guys here, holy shit, knocks it out of the park. Sees the fastball coming, has a guy on second base stealing signs, and is tipped off to the heat coming down the middle, and he crushes it 18 rows deep into the bleachers. How's that for November baseball? Uh, baseball is done. But, uh, but not really. Still, again, it lives on in every uh, television commercial for Sports Illustrated as I relive the Phillies victory. And, uh, and do you know how hard it is to masturbate for a 30-second commercial? I mean, I just try to get it over with. Oh, my God. It's, it's like the Phillies thing comes on, and it's like, all right, got to get it. I'll whip it in, bing, 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 bing. And then uh, and to try to, uh, to run off a batch quickly before the commercial ends. Uh, it's very difficult. But I'm mastering it. I'm getting very close. And uh, I, I and I've been trying for a long time. I mean, there've been other commercials that I tried to beat off to, uh, but the Phillies one is the one where I'm really perfecting my technique. All right, so hi, I'm Mike Schmidt. I am uh, the host of the Forty Year Old Boy Podcast, and I am fascinated with BBC Radio. That's right. I have plenty of other entertainment choices in my car or elsewhere. I could I have an iPod, although I can't have my iPod in my car because I don't have the hole in the dashboard. The 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 vagina i don't have a i don't have an ipod vagina in my dashboard you know you know that where the the vagina where you plug in your ipod we all have that yes that sounds horrible what if you had a vagina on your dashboard other than never leaving your car how would your life be uh would, would you would you fuck your car if you could i think you would we had this discussion once i never not funny now that it, uh, it occurs to me uh but yeah i don't have the vagina for my ipod that's like how man it, you know what that makes me think of videodrome remember you ever see videodrome long live the new flesh james woods and debbie harry and then it was like the person had the the hole in their stomach and you inserted a videotape uh, into them uh yeah that's what i think of when i think of a car vagina uh and, and i say that as if i always think of a car vagina i don't i it just came up now it literally this is, again, the perils of not having a set list, folks. You just talk and see what happens. And you know what you get to? Car vagina. That's what shows up. You get to sticking your dick into a dashboard. Stick your dick in a dashboard. See, I like the cadence of that. Stick your dick in a dashboard. That'd be a good t-shirt. Maybe <laughs> I sell that t-shirt. I jump on board. I start merchandising this show. I need to make some money somehow, folks. Uh, because the people at MasterCard are not happy. And, and but you know, it's funny because most MasterCards have a bank, like there's the Wachovia MasterCard or the Citibank MasterCard. I just have MasterCard on my tail. That's how bad it's gotten. I don't even get to compartmentalize it into different banks. Just the entire MasterCard industry is after me. Uh, and by after me, I mean they show up at my house and we run around my pool like Benny Hill. That's who comes to the guys from MasterCard. They, they have like Keystone Cop outfits and round bowlers bowler hats and they chase me around the pool and then inevitably the little ball guy slap him in the head and he falls in uh so yeah that's what i got going on folks so i'm so busy bbc radio i'm fascinated by it i can't stop listening to it because again i don't have the ipod vagina i uh because xm and sirius have merged folks and uh i could not be happier i have i have satellite radio in my car because uh here in los angeles there like i i really think that every radio station it, they just play commercials and then songs are played like commercials. Like they insert them in between. Like normally in other places in the world, there's songs and then there might be a commercial that shows up. Not here. Commercials are in a, a, a loop. And then some uh, crazy guy will come in and start screaming and then it, they play a song once. Uh, it, it got to the point where I actually thought Keys on Van Nuys was on the Billboard charts. I, I thought... <laughs> That, that's a commercial out here for a, a, a car dealership that goes keys, 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 keys on Van Nuys, and I actually I, I think it hit 11th on the on the billboard with a bullet on the billboard chart. That's how often I fucking heard it. 
So I said, you know what the hell with this? I got to get uh, uh, XM and satellite radio. And then I get that, and guess what? Uh, commercials. I didn't realize that, but they're different kind of commercials. Like, instead of being for local merchants, they're for boner pills and, and fucking, you know, how to get out of debt. Like I'm, You know what? I'm not your target audience. If, if you're putting out, I mean, I am. They don't know that. But honestly, people who own satellite radio should not be hearing how to get out of debt because they're paying for radio. Radio's free, yet they've decided to upgrade and pay for the, you know, the Cadillac of radio. And then you're telling them how to get out of the debt? I guess you figure that they have disposable income. Or they, if they're paying for radio, they must have outrageous bills that they can't get out from under uh i would definitely qualify as that as the aforementioned mastercard anecdote would explain uh so i but bbc radio it's great i like listening to it because uh it first of all they never stop playing music music is playing all the time even when they're talking even when like the dj person comes on to talk and uh and you know it's it's basically like listening to a guy Ritchie movie uh, you know in your car it's just like boom 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 all right that's what how we got a guy that's all i hear is that that's what I hear when I hear an English guy talk. All right, we should go. It sounds like somebody uh, is falling down the stairs in for, in England. That's what it sounds like. Those the British DJs because they're trying to yell over the music, and uh, it, it just it, it sounds like someone punched a regular person in the stomach. Oh yeah, that's what it sounds like to me when the British DJs are talking. I don't know what that is. I just found it on the ground. I, I'm in a, uh, Lily's house as I always am. Hey, how about Lily von Stupp, my producer, folks? I, I keep forgetting to give her her little props. Uh, not that you guys forget, because I can't tell you how many emails I received last week. Pictures of Lily should have been the music last week. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. Maybe when you do your free show, <laughs> you can put that in. It was actually one of the choices. It came down to uh, when you close your eyes, do you dream about me? Or it came down to pictures of Lily. But I had done the Who the previous week, and I've done the Who a couple of times already. And uh, I'm just anal enough to care. <laughs> about how many times I use a band. I'm like, well, look, Van Halen's the only band I should be using over and over. Yes, I talk to myself like that. That's how I address myself when I'm doing concerns, when I'm sitting at my desk in my house. Well, you know, the thing is, you shouldn't be picking the music like that. That's that guy. He comes out of me. So BBC Radio, I can't stop listening to it because I also love the fact that they name check places in England and I pretend I'm there, like driving around in my Murano. And, uh, and then I go, why are you driving on the wrong side of the road? You're, you're going to crash. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I love it. I'm a huge fan of British radio because they play, they, they, they'll play these bands where you're just like, I don't know who they are, but I like the music. But, and the thing is, you know that those bands will be famous here in like six months. Yeah. But in England, they're playing them all the time. They're like, all right, here's the Apple Jacks with Who Do You Think You Are? And then they play this song, and I'm like, I actually like this song. And then I forget about it. And then in five months, it'll be in an iPod commercial, and everybody in the world will buy it. <laughs> and I'm like, holy shit, the Apple Jacks. I remember them. And if that's not the name of a band, it should be now. I mean, I literally, in the five seconds from when I've said it, somebody out there needs to have named a band the Apple Jacks, because that's a fucking great name. <laughs> a weird week. Watch the UFC. Did you watch the UFC, Lily? Nah. Shake your head no, because it's radio. No. Yeah, thank you. I was going to say it's radio, so you shake your head. No. Uh, Brock Lesnar is uh, the next big thing. And by big, I mean fucking big. He's this giant. He's the new UFC heavyweight champ. He wound up beating Randy Couture the other night. And uh, when they came out for the for the you know in the ring to touch gloves and get the instructions from the referee, Lesnar Brock Lesnar's the kind of guy you draw when you want to draw a bad guy. Like he's just this. He's just he. It looks like it, it's if you, if you were fighting a garage door with a skull tattoo on it. I mean, he's the biggest fucking thing. I, 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 and I thought of this because in Reservoir Dogs, the greatest line is when Tim Roth is explaining about Joe Cabot to the other cop. And he goes, the thing. Motherfucker looks just like the thing. <laughs> and Brock Lesnar looks like the thing without rocks on him. He's insane. I'm just this Johnny Jaw, fucking lantern head, huge cinder block skull. I mean, he is just a monster. He, he is. He's again. He's the Kraken. That's what he is. He, he would. <laughs> He looks like he rose out of the sea to fight Randy Couture at the at the UFC. I mean, he just he crawled out of the the surf. I mean, he is a just a beast. God, is he huge? It, 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 it's, it's like somebody shaved a bear. Honestly, it's just they were like, really get in there and 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 eat something, do something. He's a monster. I'm a huge fan. Uh, I admire size, folks. I'm not gonna lie to you. I mean, you know, other people are like, they're, they're, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, that threw me off. The lady just held up a 10-minute note. She's like, you're 10 minutes in. I'm like, 10 minutes? I haven't said a fucking thing yet. <laughs> Talking about the BBC and Brock Lesnar. See? All right. Uh, it's funny. I showed Lily my notes. I have these six pages of, uh, of very professionally typed out notes. 
Um, and I'm like, see, I'm prepared for this show. Those aren't my notes. Uh, I'm doing another podcast tonight, and they sent me those. That's how fucking prepared these people are. I mean, they're like, here, and again, they sent this like two days ago. And again, when someone tells me I'm doing a podcast with them, I figure I get to show up and do this. That thing where I put on a microphone and I just talk in circles. No, no, these guys have, I, I mean, these look like legal briefs. I mean, it's, it's the most amazing I'm doing the Comics on Comics podcast tonight, and uh, go to comicsoncomics.com and get it, because I'm sure it'll be up by the time this airs. If it's not, it'll be up by the end of the week. But it's filmed, so it's like I'm actually going to be on camera talking, and it's me and Jackie Cation and, uh, and Chris Mancini from comedyfilmnerds.com. Yes, I haven't written a word for Comedy Film Nerds in, in at least a month, but they're somehow still including me in their functions, and I appreciate it. I mean, eventually I'll reward them with some sort of uh, clever piece about Raisinets, but right now... <laughs> I'm just, I'm on borrowed fucking time over at Comedy Film Nerds, but uh, I don't know, I didn't know, I don't even know if you can get fired from a free gig. I mean, I have no idea if you can, uh, although actually, that's a lie. I got fired from this gig. Remember, Eric fired me early, <laughs> in, in, like nine episodes in, so you can get fired. Even if your name's on it, you can get fired from a free gig, I found out. Uh, but I'm so, Comedy Film Nerds is doing this Comics on Comics podcast. Go to comicsoncomics.com and check that out, but, uh, and and so... Uh, I'll tell you, well, I'll tell you this Monday, we went and did a thing, uh, a radio interview for XM and it was me and, uh, Chris and Jackie from comedy film nerds. And then it was, uh, Vito and Juan from, uh, from the mob. No, it was Vito and Juan. <laughs> that sounds like, that sounded crazy. Vito and Juan, but no, they're, they're the comics on comics guys. Two of the three, I think there's a third, but the gentleman did, uh, the third, I don't remember or recall his name. Uh, he wouldn't, he wasn't there Monday. All right. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's in my uh, copious notes maybe his name's in here somewhere jesus god i uh so it's funny i go to xm the other day to do this show and we did Na uh, nadine at night which will air this friday on uh channel 154 national lampoon radio and uh, uh so go ahead and check out nadine at night and hear a clusterfuck of a radio program <laughs> go you know what go listen to nadine at night and hear six people with three microphones trying to get a word in edgewise and uh, and trying to be funny about movies and yet convey the fact that there's going to be a show and then it was funny we get there oh here's here's i go so i go to national lampoon uh, world headquarters down on sunset boulevard and they buzz me in because very high security at national lampoon <laughs> god forbid somebody comes in and steals the print of vacation so i i don't i don't want anybody to come in and steal their uh the, their the humor they've had uh, stored there since 1978 and haven't used so anyway i uh i'm there to go to national lampoon and do their thing so and i should have an in there because i worked on national lampoon's funny money so you would think that these people would recognize me they'd be like hey look at that guy remember when he was really fat and he wrote on a show we did uh, on National Lampoon's Funny Money. That's the only time I've ever done stand-up on TV, by the way, is on National Lampoon's Funny Money. And I did a minute on each show because it's a game show where you had to do a minute of stand-up. <laughs> oh, awful. And I don't even have, a, like, a tape of it. I don't have a copy of it. I wrote on the goddamn show. I don't even have a copy of it. I can't even imagine how crazy fat I must have looked. Oh, Jesus. This is... Because this is fat, Mike. This was a time... This is when I was actually considering getting the uh, gastric bypass, but then didn't get it because I got that job. And I was like, fuck that. I need to keep this job. I, you know, it's my first ever Hollywood uh, type writing job. So I couldn't let it go. So I was like, I don't care if I die. <laughs> I, don't have to, I have to take this gig. <laughs> so, uh, so National Lampoon has, uh, uh, this interview on Monday. So I show up, they buzz me in and, uh, I say, I'm looking for Nadine. And the woman goes, you know what? She's upstairs in the radio room. It's on the left-hand side. So I go, okay, great. So I walk up the stairs. I see the radio room. I look and there's three people in there. And a guy in a hat waves me in. He just goes, oh, he points and he waves me in. So I walk in and this woman goes, what are you doing? And I go, I, I'm looking for Nadine. She goes, yeah, we're in the middle of an interview. And I go, okay, well, uh, they sent me upstairs. I don't know. And she goes, yeah, go. I go, I'm here for comedy film. She goes, go downstairs. Like, and just like, is really, you know, annoyed and mad. And rightfully so, because I walked into a fucking room, but there's no on air light in the hallway. So I didn't know it. And the guy waved me in the dude. I can only imagine how, how poorly that show must have been going. The guy's like, hey, let's get this idiot from the hallway in on this. We, I, I don't know where this is going, but I think that guy in the Bolingbroke Raiders sweatshirt needs to pop in here and, and help us all. Because, I mean, so I, I and I, I go, all right. And I leave and then I'm chastised and I feel like an idiot because 
there's nothing worse than looking like you don't know how things work. Like, I don't know that you don't walk into a room that's on the air. Of course I know that. But again, there's no on-air light in the hallway. And I got waved in. There was camaraderie with one of the cast members of that show. So I go downstairs, and then I'm sitting on a couch, and then Jackie and Chris show up, and I go, yeah, I met Nadine. Uh, I don't know if she's going to want me in her office. <laughs> and I explain, and again, I was waved up by the receptionist. That other dude's like, hey, come on in. And uh, Nadine stared a hole through my fucking head. She wanted to kill me. And uh, so we waited, and then we went upstairs, and we did the interview. And then they filmed it for something, too. I don't know if it's for National Lampoon's website, but uh, it's so funny. These oper- you know, it's National Lampoon. So you're like, all right, well, this is going to be top-notch. I'm going you know, to get uh, free cookies and jelly beans and a, and a glass of water. <laughs> Uh, we walk into a room that's got like a velvet cover on, you know, on the console, and then there's three microphones for six people and two 19-year-old college kids holding handheld DV, you know, cameras to try to record the moment for posterity for college campuses. I mean, it's just because you, you hear National Lampoon, you think, all right, well, this is going to be rocking, and it's it's all gorilla. I mean, it's just you walk into offices and it's these spare offices with like cup of noodles on the desk. I mean, it, it was just, it, it was not what you think. It wasn't, the, their corporate headquarters needs a, 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 an extreme <laughs> makeover. And I mean extreme. Starting with uh, the guy who waved me in getting fired. Uh, but he's, he actually, he doesn't work there. We met him later. He's a nice, uh, he was a nice guy named Daryl and he seemed nice. Uh, but uh, I don't know if he doesn't know how radio works either to just go, hey. But again, I can't, I can't imagine how bad they were flailing on that show. And then if they saw me in the hallway and went, let's get him involved. <laughs> Terrible. Uh, so then we go to do the interview. And again, it'll air on XM 154 this weekend. So check it out, Nadine at Night. And again, with nine people trying to be funny with three microphones. And, uh, and then, the, and again, people who don't know each other. So I, mean, I, I know Jackie and Chris, but they don't know me to, to be into my sense of humor or to be in with timing. Like... There's very few people that I can play ping pong with right off the bat. You know, Pardo is one of them and, and, and uh, someone who can actually just sit in and we're in a fucking groove right from the jump. And so when I'm I'm kind of a deadpan guy and I'll say things and everybody will look at me and, and you just have to make a face like, I'm kidding. Of course I'm kidding. Uh, and then they'll, they'll even say stuff. They'll be like, you know, then on a break, they're just like, wow, you're, you're so like deadpan and straight faced on everything you say. And I'm like, yes, but please let's all assume that at the comedy radio show, I'm just being funny. <laughs> That's going to help if we all jump on the Mike Schmidt is being funny bandwagon and realize that I'm, you know, I might have the needle out and I might be shiving guys and having some fun, but I mean, none of it's serious. We're just goofing around, you know I mean? That's the point. Uh, it, it was, you know, so then the show is called Comics on Comics, and it's a show about comic books. Um, and it's comedians talking about comic books. And then, so then, the woman drops, you know, Nadine, and here's another thing, Nadine, again, this is not her fault, but we show up and she's like, all right, what are you, who are you guys, what are you from, what's going on? Like, she has no show notes, uh, and Vito's like, ah, oh, you know what, I was supposed to email you that stuff, I apologize. And I can't believe that he didn't email it, because after he sent me this fucking dictionary, I don't know why he, I can't. I picture him, you know why he didn't email it to her? Because he was busy typing out this script. This 80-page thing of notes for tonight's show. And literally, it's just going to be me sitting there just, you know, being a, a, a dick. I, I mean, everybody else is going to talk about, like, literally, this is what it says. The X-Men relocate to San Francisco. And then there's four paragraphs about it. I think the title sentence said it all. Unless we're going to talk about real estate prices and where Wolverine's going to get a job. You know, the, and the X-Men moved to San Francisco. How, how popular is Gambit going to be on the, in the Castro? <laughs> Gambit shows up wearing his Gambit suit. Everybody's going to be like, oh, we got to tag Gambit. I'm in. <laughs> For that matter, how popular are all the X-Men going to be in the Castro? Because they they'll just walk out in their gayest gay costumes, and it's like Wolverine's got the claws, and how many dudes are going to be lining up going, oh, seriously, tie me up and jam that up my ass. <laughs> Adamantium? Uh, schmadamantium. Just somebody fuck me immediately. <laughs> Wolverine with his gay hair. Oh my God! The X Men in San Francisco. That sounds like the worst like crossover porn comic book you'd ever imagine. Storm and Rogue being ignored, sitting up in the corner, and they Storm makes a tornado to blow every gay guy into the ocean. They're tired of not getting hit on. What is that? Is that what they exist for? Storm and Rogue? Are they? They're just there. That's their whole deal. They want to get hit on. I, I guess apparently when you're a superhero s, you want to get laid when you go to San Francisco. That's what happens immediately. Uh, and Rogue can't fuck anybody, right? Because she's uh, doesn't she suck your power out of you? I don't know. I think so. I haven't read comics. Again, I'm doing this comics on comics show. 
and and they asked me on the on the the National Lampoon thing. She's like, "What comic books do you read?" Wow, I don't, I have no idea. I and I uh, somehow we got in the point of jerking off. I'm sure that came up, and then I wound up talking. And she's like, "She," I, I mentioned jerking off to comic books. I, I, I don't know how it. <laughs> It spiraled out of control where somebody said something about jerking off to a, a thing. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm in. And they were like, you know, like the porn books. I'm like, no, I jerk off to everything. I don't care. Who's that? Marmaduke? Pants down. Let's go. <laughs> I'm smearing some ink. Let's get moving. Uh, yeah, so I'll be doing that show tonight and with my six pages of notes. So that's the thing is I didn't uh, I met them the other day and they're like, we'll send you guys like a brief synopsis of what we're going to do. And I said, great. And then I got the email from Chris and it was like here's the show notes but it, uh, all it had was like the address of the gig so I didn't think anything of it till today when I went on to get the address and I, there was an attachment of show notes and that's when I downloaded this bible <laughs> of things to talk about it's just gonna be nerd central tonight and me just sitting there like my head going back and forth you know what I'm gonna be like you ever see in the uh <laughs> in Willy Wonka the original one when Slugworth keeps showing up when the kids keep finding their golden tickets <laughs> Well, he goes, and it's when Mike TV is talking, and Slugworth has a microphone, and he keeps putting the microphone rink to Mike TV to another guy, to Mike TV, and to another. That's me. I'm going to be Slugworth tonight, just moving my head around. Oh, that's going to be brutal. I can't wait to do it. That'll be fantastic. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to be asked. I just hope I don't fail them. You know what I mean? It's like, this is a weird week for me. I've done like nine podcasts. Like, uh, uh, sat in and, uh, you know, and I'll get to that at the end of the show. I'll plug them all and tell you where to find them all. But, uh, oh, that's the thing. We're, we did the direct TV uh, thing. So, like I said, we walk in and Nadine doesn't know anything about us. And Vito's like, oh, I should have emailed you. Uh, and then we start to uh, talk about what we're going to talk about. And Nadine mentions this will air Friday. And Vito had told us, that it was going to air Wednesday before we did the show. So we were going to plug the show and start talking about it and try to get people out to it. Well, that's changed. Now we have to talk like we're in the future. Like all of us have to pretend like we did the show already and it was a fantastic success. And I think people will realize what a success it was when you hear seven people talking into three microphones. Once you hear that, you're going to go, wow, this must have been a great show. Everybody talking together at the same time. Hey, is there some superhero of silence who can come in and quiet everybody for a few minutes? I need him to swoop in and put a cone of fucking silence on everybody. There's got to be that guy. Like, you know, uh, uh, Silent Joe. Wouldn't that be? A, that's not a superhero name at all. That's like a name of a villain. Oh, the Puppet Master? You have him come in and shut us all up. Uh, my friend uh, my friend uh, was in uh, Heroes. He played the Puppet Master. And, and then yesterday I saw him on Defamer. They had him on the front page, the, Def the Puppet Masters. I called him at like one in the morning. I'm like, dude, put on Defamer. Put on Defamer. Like it's a TV show. Dude, put on Defamer. Immediately turn your computer to channel Defamer. I'm an old man. Uh, I mean, I got an email. Oh, here's a weird thing. A guy I know uh, died. <laughs> It's the weirdest thing because he's, he's, you know, it's a guy I knew and I worked with for, for several years and he wound up, he wound up dying. And, uh, I got an email from other people that I used to work with a guy and he wrote me and he's like, look, I don't know if you heard, um, but this person died and, uh, a, I hadn't heard, <laughs> I don't know. I was, for some reason I wasn't tapped into the zeitgeist of old the people I used to, I met who died. I don't have a Google alert for everybody I've known who've passed away. <laughs> Uh, so it was just a weird email to get. And I felt awful because, you know, I haven't talked to this person, but it was a person I would see. It's a person from Chicago. Whenever I would go home to Chicago, I would see this person, um, you know, because I uh, would, whatever, I would see them. It, it wasn't a person who I would consider a close friend, but it was somebody I knew. And I, like I said, I saw them every day for like three or four years for a while. Um, so then this person sent me an email and said this person had died and I just wanted you to know. And, and, and so that was fine. And uh, it was very strange. And, and I, I dealt with it for a couple of days. And I'm not good at that. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you, folks. I am bad at death. Uh, not that anybody's good at it. Who's good at it? Is there anybody who's like, oh, I cannot wait till all my friends die. That's going to be fantastic. I got to tell you, I am certainly going to be at my best when somebody dies. Uh, although I will say that for me, I, that is true about me. I, uh, uh, I am at my best at awake. I have never been funnier in my life than I am at a fucking wake. And it's not even a joke. Like, because I don't want to deal with what's going on. I, I wind up being, I am the funniest guy in the room, which is not hard at awake. Let's be honest with ourselves. 
It's not like everybody else is doing shtick and off in the corner. And they don't set up a microphone for me or anything. But at the same time, I will. I have never been funnier in my life. Than, the, the, the two funniest times I've ever been in my life have been at Wakes. I, I'm telling you. I uh, um, and I I don't know why that is, man. I don't. I I, I know exactly why it is because I'm avoiding what's happening. I'm just. I want nothing to do with the reality of the situation. So I I essentially I do a six hour version of this podcast <laughs> at awake. I want to talk about anything and fucking everything besides the fact that someone I know is dead in the front of the room. I want nothing to do with that. Uh, uh, one of my best friends in the world, his, uh, we had a close family member of his died a long time ago when we were, when I was much younger and I was so funny at that wake. Like, I mean, I was hysterical at it. I mean, you know, I don't know if anybody appreciated it or uh, realized it, but, uh, they did sort of, because then we'd be out in the lobby and, uh, and I was, I, I knew it. I, cause you know why I showed up and I was really funny and I couldn't stop being funny. And it was like, people were laughing and in spite of themselves. And, uh, and it was because I did not want to go into that room. I wanted nothing to do with going in and seeing my friend dead. I mean, it was just, it's so awful. So I will arm's length the shit out of it by standing out in the lobby and just being hilarious. And I'm sure there are people who are offended by that, man. I'm sure there are people who show up and they're, because I, you know why? Because I am that person to a certain extent. I, uh, I went to my dad's wake and I don't recommend that by the way, folks. Uh, if you can avoid your father's wake, by all means do so. And let's put it, if you can avoid it when you're 13, definitely do, avoid it. I would not go, if I'm you, if that, and again, if you're listening now and you're under 13, that's, I'm talking to you because everybody else, <laughs> pretty much everybody else, the possibility does not exist anymore for them to do that unless they go back in time and weirdly go back in time and kill their father. Why would they do that? Boy, I wish I could go back in time to when I was uh, not 13 and then kill my dad and then go to his wake. That would be the worst invention of a time machine. The worst reason to invent a time machine ever. If only I could build a time machine, go back to when I was 12, kill my father, and then go to his wake. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, w I don't recommend going to any wake when you're 13, let alone your dad's. But uh, I'm there, and my dad died. Um, he died the day before my 13th birthday, which was uh, awkward. Uh, because, let me tell you, the party was awful. I, uh, <laughs> there's just that, just that one unwrapped gift I'm staring at going, wow, I don't even know. I, I, you know, cause if he didn't get me anything good, that's what I'm going to remember most of all. What if the last thing he got me is the shittiest gift in the world? Although quite frankly, his death probably above that on the list of shittiest gifts I've ever received on my birthday, the death of my father. Uh, that's a comic book, by the way. The, the shittiest gift you'll ever receive, the death of your father. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so he, um, he wound up doing that, which, uh, again, just, uh, and which was really awkward when they had, because I, uh, I, on my cake, uh, they had the little uh, marzipan coffin, which I thought was really <laughs> in horrible, horrible taste. Uh, I don't know if they were trying to cheer me up, whatever. Maybe they knew that I was hilarious at Wakes. They knew that was coming. So. Uh, so my dad dies and, uh, and I go to his wake and it was, uh, I was not funny at that wake. I can tell you folks, I had not, uh, I had no comedy chops, uh, at 13. If I did, I certainly didn't feel like pulling them out uh, with my dad in a box. So, uh, and I remember sitting there at that wake, uh, and seeing my youngest brother, um, Scott, who at the time was, let's see, he was seven and, uh, or he would have been seven. He was six and he was, it was so funny to me being, it was so detached because in the back of the room, everybody was eating and laughing and, and joking around and talking. And, you know, they got some McDonald's and some people had brought some dishes and, and everybody's, you know, they're, they're existing as if they're at the weirdest cocktail party imaginable. <laughs> because, uh, uh, you know, they're all wearing fashionable black, which is fine. That, that works out great. Uh, and in the front of the room, there's my six-year-old brother uh, on, kneeling on that weird uh, kneeling thing. I don't even know the name of it. Uh, and just looking at my dad. And uh, and I took that as a way, it, like in my head, even at 13, I went, this is a, a weird and awful ritual that no one should ever have to experience. Because it, it, it it's, I can't even explain to you the feeling. Because I know at six, you, you know, because my dad wasn't there anyway. You know, it, uh, it, a lot of things happened. There was a divorce. And then he decided to uh, raise five kids. Why, I'd rather drink. So uh, he disappeared. <laughs> And, but not disappeared. He was always showing up on the weekend uh, to take us to a beer garden somewhere. That was fun. I can tell you that. 
Because five, <laughs> let me tell you, five kids at a beer garden, uh, <laughs> other than being a great sitcom, is also a wonderful thing to uh, way to spend a weekend. My dad would go, we would go to Old Chicago, which was this indoor amusement park in Bolingbrook, Illinois. And, uh, and it was perfect for my dad because my dad would just literally give us tickets and go, all right, go ride the rides. And then he would sit in the beer garden and get tanked. And, uh, and then, uh, actually the most exciting ride, driving home with my dad from Old Chicago. That was, that was certainly more exciting than any roller coaster or, or rotor or Ferris wheel or salt and pepper shaker we could climb into. Imagine five kids just sitting in a, like a you know, wood panel side station wagon, white knuckling the shit out of the doors going, all right, dad, honestly, I mean, <laughs> uh, just plowed out of his mind and driving with his kids in the car. My dad, uh, he's a, a fabulous guy. So he, uh, so he winds up, so my little brother didn't really know him anyway. He just knew him as the weird guy who would go, who would show up once a week drunk and then, uh, you know, get yell at my mom and then take us for beef jerky. You know what I mean? It was like, they, my dad didn't do a lot of great planning for our weekends together. So he, uh, uh, so then when he died, I knew my little brother was just trying to make, I, I was trying to get in his head. Even at 13, I knew that the, how awkward and strange that was for him to be looking at this guy and kind of knowing it was his dad, but also at the same time, not knowing this man at all. All he knew is it was a, probably the first dead body he'd ever seen in his life. And I say that with confidence. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something, folks. <laughs> You are a fucking idiot. That is probably, and I, I'm going to go on a, on a limb here, folks. Listen to me. That was quite possibly the first dead body my six-year-old brother had ever seen in his life. You're an idiot. Oh, dude. Oh, fuck. Oh, shit. You know what? If I bust that out at that wake, my record's complete. <laughs> if only I'd have thought of that when I was 13. <laughs> that is, folks, I got to tell you, that is definitely the first dead body my six-year-old brother had ever seen in his life. <laughs> I say that with absolute confidence. All right. So, Jesus. Oh, that was funny. <laughs> so, uh, so he's trying to make sense of it. You know what I mean? He, it's a dead body and it's his dad, but it's not a guy that he knows. So it's just, it's just crazy. So, uh, but then wakes, oh my God. I, and then I went to my brother-in-law's wake. That was, uh, um, and that was, oh, that was horrible. But, but again, I was hysterical. I mean, it was, it was, it was awful because, you know, everybody's there. But I, it was funny. Max was with me. Max showed up. And Max, Max decided, apparently, he caught the bug. He was like, you know what? I'm going to be hysterical, too. So Max and I, and the thing, here was what was funny is a little kid. There was a little kid in my, uh, in my, my wife's family uh, because a lot of cousins, of course, everybody from uh, different states came in. So this young kid who, uh, it, it was just, again, <laughs> you know who he was? He was me. And I really, I really recognized that because he was like a 12-year-old boy at a wake for a guy he didn't even know. And that's how I felt at my father's wake. Because again, my father, the times that he was around, he was terrible. And, uh, and then I'm at his wake and I'm supposed to feel bad, but I don't know what to feel. And I'll be honest with you, and I'm sure you've probably surmised this now, even at 41, I don't know how to feel. I'm still processing. <laughs> I'm still processing that thing about my dad. And, and it's not, you know, absolutely. And we all do. You all, you know, whenever that's how it works. So, uh, so this kid shows up at this wake and I know and he's lonely. He doesn't know anybody. He's, you know, he's from Alabama. And I, I can't, first of all, that's bad enough, but then, you know, that's gotta be like the ultimate good news, bad news scenario. It's like, Hey son, we're going to a wake, but the good news is we get to leave Alabama for a couple of days. <laughs> he's like, okay. So, uh, so you're, we're going to visit a dead guy, but the good news, we get to leave the place where all feeling and knowledge is dead. So let's go ahead and get out of here. Uh, and I've never been to Alabama. I'm sure those people are wonderful people. My wife's family is from there. And, uh, and thankfully none of them listen to the podcast because none of them know what I do. They just know that I'm always home to answer the phone when they call, even during the day. They don't know what is Michael working? What's his job? What's he doing? No one knows. Uh, 
but uh, so I had a, you know I was a pallbearer at, at, at my brother-in-law's funeral, which was terrible. And uh, but my, Mex and I, this kid, this 12-year-old kid, you could see he was just like lonely and alone. And he winds up talking to, uh, you know, basically he saw David and I talking, Mex and I, and um, and he was fascinated by us. Like you could just see. He was like, who are these adults that are talking to me like an adult? And, and why are they? I mean, we were an ocean of sanity in what must have been, again, as, as a 12-year-old kid, I completely relate. I, I remember hating those people for laughing at my dad's wake. I, wa- I wanted them, you know, I, I just, I, I, I internalized the rage and I was so angry about it. And it shows up every now and again. I'm sure that's probably where it comes from, you know, one of the places. But I know what that kid was feeling. And then he wound up following Mex and I for, I'm talking like four hours. Like he hung out with us the entire day because we would joke with him as if he was our age because we're children. Mex and I are both kids. So <laughs> all we're doing is ludicrous stuff. And I'm, I'm, you know, when I say funny at awake, it's not like I'm, you know, flipping the corpse's tie. I mean, I'm not that weird. You know, it's not like I'm not doing a, you know, a crazy, like making him sit up and then moving his mouth. I mean, it's not that kind of funny. <laughs> I mean, it's the kind of awkward funny where you won't turn around and look at the coffin because you don't want to deal with reality, so you're just hysterical. Like, again, I, I, the best way to put it is it was this podcast for six hours in a funeral home, uh, which for some of you might sound – some of you might prefer death at that point. Some of you would be like, you know what, I'm going to climb into a box and I'm done with it, uh, uh, which is too bad for you because then I show up at your wake and I'm hysterical. I am fucking drop dead funny, and yes, pun fully intended. So I'm not good with death. Not not like any of you are, but uh, but so so I get the email from my friend, uh, uh, my friend, our mutual friend. He tells us our mutual friend is dead, and uh, and that's awkward and strange. And and I so I don't know what to do. Um, so I didn't write him back. I didn't write him an email back. And, and big shock, big surprise to you folks. <laughs> Uh, but all it was was a note. He was just basically dropping me a note saying, hey, this happened. I, I think you should be aware of it, and that's that. Uh, so that's fine. I tell Karen. We talk about it a little bit. I try to process my feelings. I go to, uh, I make an after-school special about it, and uh, it's on YouTube. Go ahead and look it up. <laughs> it's called Death is Funny. And uh, so, but then, like like two days later, my friend writes me again. and uh, And my friend, by the way, writes in all caps. So as as we all all of you internet savvy people know that's shouting on on but it, he doesn't know it's shouting he's just a guy honestly I don't think he knows that the caps lock button is pushed on his computer <laughs> he doesn't know what it is he doesn't know it exists he thinks all computer type is capitalized because it's robot talk I think that's what he thinks like he he all of his emails he sees them and they're all capitalized and he thinks oh well that's because that's what a robot that's how a robot talks Mike did you know that our friend is dead. I just thought you should know. I wanted to tell you. Stop. <laughs> Signed, guy you know. So he he sees all caps, and he just thinks that's a robot sending messages. Uh, so then the second message comes, and it's like, hey, Mike, I uh, you know I wrote you a note about our mutual friend's death, and I haven't heard back. So I'm just wondering, you know, uh, what you're doing and how you're dealing with it, and uh, or, uh, no, not how you're dealing with it. I just want to make sure you got it. Want to make sure you know that this is going on. Which then makes me kind of weird, because like. I mean, am I supposed to fly home and do a eulogy? I, I I don't know. I mean, granted, I didn't respond, and I should have responded even with a, just a, man, I'm sorry to hear that, or, oh, that's awful, or, uh, hey, did he leave me anything in his will? You know, I need to check on those things. Uh, but, uh, again, see, folks, that that's hysteria. Uh, that's, that's humor in the face of death. So... I don't I don't know what he wanted. I, like, I, I don't know what he's looking for from me. Maybe, you know... Gee, Mike, maybe he's looking for a compassion and a consolation from a fellow friend who knew this person. Maybe he's looking for genuine human emotion from a guy who'd much rather yuck it up and not deal with fucking reality. Could that be a possibility? Yes, it could be. So I, I, he wrote me the second email, and uh, uh, so I immediately didn't write him back. I, I made sure... I made sure to make it on him. Like, I made him the weird one. Like, it, it, like in my head, I was like, what is he writing me back a second time for? Yeah, I get it. The guy's dead. I, nothing I can do about it. Uh, which is, of course, my infantile and selfish way of dealing with things. So, uh, I only mention this because today, as I was downloading 47 pages of comic book notes for tonight's debacle, <laughs> uh, I got another email from my friend. And all it says is R.E. And it has our, our, the friend who passed away's name. R.E. him. And uh, uh, I didn't open it because I don't want to know what it says. Unless 
he's come back from the dead, which would be an interesting email to send. Because that's why he would be the subject of it, R.E. him. Uh, don't know if you've heard, he rose from the grave and is killing uh, all of our mutual friends. <laughs> Reinforce your locks. Uh, no, so he, I, I don't know. And again, I'm, I'm terrible at that. So I don't know how to deal with it. I, I do write him like a human being. Uh, just sit down and write a, a nice note like you planned on doing. And, uh, but I just, I, I, I wind up cocooning myself from that, man. I, 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 again, unless I can go and, and do this, uh, you know, then I, and I got to grow up. I know I got to grow up. I'm, I'm 41 and, and, you know, people I know are going to die. <laughs> it sounds weird. It's like when I was thinking, again, when I was in high school, there was a kid in high school who died. He drowned in a wash, you know, like in the, uh, in the DuPage River, it, it, it swelled up and he wound up uh, dying. And, uh, and he became a punchline. Like for us, like, you know, again, that's what you do dealing with death. Or at least that's what I do because I'm fucking retarded. But my friends and I, my friend Mike Scott and I used to do these things called impossible situations. Uh, like, and we would kill hours doing them when we weren't playing slap hockey in his basement uh, and watching MTV, which had just premiered. Uh, stunned by MTV going, you know what, in five videos, your favorite video of all time is on. And then Lena Lovich coming on singing New Toy, and you'd be like, ha, dude, you love Lena Lovich! Like, that was the way it worked. You, we would sit there for hours, because we were fascinated by MTV. We couldn't get enough of it. And and we would say stuff like, oh, dude, you can't, you're not going to believe this. In three videos, your favorite video of ever, ever is on. And then Haircut 100 on him, you'd be like, dude, you're a total fag. You love Haircut 100. Because when you're 13, that's hysterical. Uh, so he, uh, uh, he and I would do impossible situations, which would, would consist of you turning to your friend and go, uh, all right, Mr. Harvey from the science department shows up at your house tomorrow. What do you do? And then it would go for an hour and inevitably it would wind up with you having gay sex with somebody in your class that you didn't want to. Uh, but Mike, the zombie Mike Powelski would always wind up in our stories. Like Mike Powelski's the kid who drowned. He, his corpse would always somehow turn up his either as a zombie and you would have to avoid him. Or he would come to your rescue in some way, like his ghost. And uh, uh, so that's, I've been doing this since I was a kid, I guess is the message I give there. And I give out Mike Powelski's name. So just in case his family is listening, I'm glad I harmed them even further by telling them that the death of their son became a punchline for me for 30 years. To the point where when I went to my 20th high school reunion, I was going to write Mike Powelski on the, on the sticker and put it on my shirt. That's how horrible it was. That's how much of a ridiculous idiot I am. I was going to do that. Uh, but instead, I went with Cheryl Butchko. Who was another woman we went to school with who I, I just picked up her sticker and put it on and wore it all night long. <laughs> that was my, uh, was my 25th reunion. Yeah, I think it was my 25th reunion. Uh, <laughs> I was Cheryl Butchko for my 25th reunion. Uh, that's where's the twenty fifth? Let's see, that's eighty. It's two thousand five. Yeah, that's that because that was when Karen was gone. Karen and I were split up. So I actually, and then I went home, and I, in my head, you know, because you're split up, you have that weird thing where you're like, hey, I'm kind of like, I could actually like fuck a chick from my high school reunion now if I wanted to. Uh, but sadly, the only one I had a chance with didn't show up. Cheryl Butchko. <laughs> Could have tagged her. Uh, I had no shot with Cheryl Butchko. She was far too brainy. Now, Sharon Brain, I would have loved a shot at her title. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's, I said shot at the title. That's the worst line I've ever used on somebody, folks, by the way. Uh, I, I will tell you, there was a girl uh, in school, I won't say her name, I won't embarrass her, but I found out that recently she's like sort of famous. And by sort of famous, I mean she's been on TV. So I guess that makes me sort of famous. <laughs> Uh, whatever. So uh, this was a person that uh, I I really uh, uh, had a thing for when I was younger, and she and I became friends. And then we actually spent like every day together for a year. Like we became friends. She was a st you know because she was not only like really hot, but she was really funny and smart, and we got along great. So we spent a whole summer together, and and we had a great time. And it was this, and it was that weird thing where she was like, "Wow, we're great friends," and and I'm going, "Wow, I would." love to fuck this girl i mean really when is it gonna happen uh and uh and you know we never you know we i think we made out a couple times whatever i who cares you're bored by that already so uh but it was the kind of thing where like we actually talked one time and we were like hey if we're not married by 40 uh we're you know meeting at the top of the world trade center and getting married and uh son of a bitch fucking terrorists ruined that 
<laughs> Jerks. What are you doing to me? How do you ruin my sleepless in Seattle moment, you fucks? Uh, and I don't even know. Was it Sleepless in Seattle where they had to meet at the top of the, uh, the whatever? I don't even know. It was one of those movies with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan's lips. Meg Ryan's crazy head came floating out of an elevator. You could see it from space. She's had like all that weird surgery. It's like, you know, it's like we look up at the, at the moon and we see the face in the moon. People on the moon look down here and see Meg Ryan's head. It was with a bad surgery. She gets, she, literally, she went to the doctor and said, hey, could you put a vagina on my face? That'd be great. I want my face to look like Mike Schmidt's dashboard. <laughs> she just she went in and said she did. She went in and said, "Hey, you know what? Give me the Joker. I, I want the Joker package. Uh, could you make my smile a lot wider? Could you do me a favor? Cut my mouth open to my ears because I think that's what people want to see when I smile is my gums. I'm hoping somehow they could see my back by cuspid molar. I don't know the name of the back teeth, but I'm going to say all of them uh, incisor ripper terrors." So, uh, so this person, so, uh, uh, then I wind up moving after she and I were that close. She went to school and, uh, and made something of herself and I went and made nothing of myself, uh, to the point where I had to crawl back to Chicago. Uh, and, uh, as I did, I wound up, uh, kind of meeting her again and, uh, uh, we wound up going out a couple times and she was dating a guy. So it was like all, it was serious, like, no, nah, nah, not serious. Uh, but I say not serious from my end. She was dating a guy, so for her, I'm sure it was serious. From my end, I was like, whatever. So then uh, the most embarrassing, awkward thing I've ever done, like we, uh, uh, one night I was saying goodnight to her, and I hugged her, and I hugged her a little too long. You know, like that weird, uh, well, actually, let me get, I'm getting, I'm getting uh, ahead of myself. The best one I ever did was we went up, uh, we, one of the times we went out, uh, she was still dating this guy, and, uh, and I was flush with confidence from my incredible stand-up comedy career. <laughs> And we were talking, and uh, uh, she uh, we, she wound up dropping me off where I was, and uh, and I had hit on her, and she had been kind of like weird. Not she wasn't weird. She was like, let's put it this way. I think she was giving me the benefit of the doubt because we'd been friends for so long, but she didn't, didn't actually shoot me down. But she kind of was like, well, I'm dating a guy, and that was that thing. And I actually said to her, I said, well, I'll tell you what, I want a shot at the title. I actually said that. Like that was what that was my, that was my like line. Like uh, you know. I, I said, well, you know what? I want a shot at the title. And when you're ready for it, you know where I am. Like, what? Who are you? I, I, I picture her at that point just going, okay, we are done forever being friends or anything ever from this point on. Like, in her mind, she just shut me out and just went, I, whatever goodwill you had built up over the nine years of, of pursuing me has just been shit down the drain from I want a shot at the title. Like Mel fucking Gibson and Lethal Weapon. You know, you're not fighting Gary Busey on the lawn. You're trying to get a girl into the sack. Who do you think you are? You can't come on like a stiff prick. You're an idiot. Oh, terrible. I'm <laughs> blushing now thinking about saying it. And her face. Like, her face was kind of, like, amused, but also, like, what? I want a shot at the title. Oh, God. Uh, and then we actually went out one more time, and I went up when I was saying goodbye to her, I was hugging her, and I held that hug, like, a little too long. And, like, and she kind of pulled, she went to pull away, but not, like, crazy, like, running. But and I and I and I cinched around her waist a little more, like I didn't want to let her go, and and she was just kind of like, all right, I have to go, and it was that weird, okay, I'll let you go now, and then uh, that was it. I think that's the last time I saw her, uh, <laughs> which is now. awful, huh? She's dead, She's dead now. now, sure. Uh, and I I I showed up and I was hilarious. <laughs> Uh, no, man, she's famous now. That's the thing is it was like, you know, with those, yeah, that graveyard gig is terrible. You end up Googling shit in the middle of the night. You're like, oh, hi, that person. I knew them and they're famous. Uh, Googled Mike Powelski, still dead. Weird. That's what, and that's actually the Google entry. It just comes up. Mike Powelski, still dead. That's a website. That's what Mike, Mike Scott and I have that website. Mike Powelski is still dead.com. Go visit it. It's fantastic. Just the, literally, it's just that kid, his freshman high school photo, just frozen in time. His, how horrible would that be? His family would just be like, what are you, it's bad enough I'm talking about it now, but his family would just, if we had some weird, like, website like that, think about that. Mike Puelski is still dead.com, and you went to it, and it just had his face with, like, the years he lived. 1967 to 1980, or 81, or no, 65 probably, or 64. No, 66, because I was 60, I was 13 in high school, and because uh, I was double promoted, folks. I don't know if I mentioned that. I'm very smart. 
<laughs> and I've done nothing with it. Except uh, be funny on the internet and be funny at wakes. <laughs> if there's a dead guy in the room, I am, I'm your man. Call me up. Maybe, that, you know, maybe that's why my friend keeps sending me notes. He's <laughs> like, Mike, I, we hear how funny you are. You need to come and liven up this wake, please. Because it's so depressing. I don't imagine his kids are going to enjoy this wake much. Could you show up, please, and, and really make it great? <laughs> yes, of course I could. I'll be happy to. I imagine those people are just waiting with bated breath. Oh, if someone could please lift the pallor in this room. Uh, I should just book myself for wakes. Shouldn't I? That's what I should do. He's available. For, they always had that old joke, available for children's parties, available for wakes. But I fucking mean it. Like, I should just, you know, pull out the, the newspaper and find old bits and just be like, oh, there's a memorial service. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Traveling the country. The Mike Schmidt, not yet in the ground tour, 2008. <laughs> The Mike Schmidt Laugh Yourself Stiff Tour. <laughs> or Wake Up. Just call it that. Mike Schmidt Wake Up Tour 2009. <laughs> All right. You guys can write me at Mike at Mike Schmidt Comedy dot com or at MySpace dot com slash Mike Schmidt Comedy. You can write me. You can become my friend on MySpace. Go ahead and do that if you'd like. I know you would like to. Uh, just on the off chance you have a close relative or friend who dies, you might have me on hand so you can send me a note in all caps. I, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, my, Mike Schmidt, uh, Mike at Mike Schmidt comedy.com or myspace.com slash Mike Schmidt comedy. Uh, you guys, you know, you can subscribe in iTunes, uh, go ahead and leave a review at iTunes. That would be great. I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, that's great when you do. And uh, also, also, and plugs. I have a litany of plugs, folks. Let me tell you. Uh, first of all, comicsoncomics.com. There's going to be a, uh, it's a video podcast. So you can see my insanity with uh, an actual head attached. <laughs> uh, and, and honest, I got to be, I'm probably going to be very silent during the proceedings. <laughs> because they're, I, I'm a freewheeling idiot. You know, that's, and that, there you go. That's the name of my album, Freewheeling Idiot. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm, I'm that guy who just chimes in. I'm, I'm more of a, uh, uh, you know, if, if I'm not just talking, I've got to kind of chime in and be funny. And there's like a real co comic book guy who's going to be at this thing. And I know I'm going to say the wrong thing. You know, like I'm going to ask him, you know, if he, uh, if he drew Howard the duck or some weirdness, <laughs> and, you know, this guy's probably like a, a very accomplished artist and someone who does an amazing job. And all I'm going to want to ask about is, uh, you know, uh, where, do, why does the Spider-Man wear underwear or not? You know what I mean? Like just something retarded. So, uh. Come watch, watch me make a fool of myself at comicsoncomics.com. I think the show itself, I don't know when it will be edited and up, hopefully by the time you hear this, uh, or else you're just going there for no reason. But go to comicsoncomics.com and uh, follow that. Keep a beat on that. This is their season finale. So uh, let's hope that we are good enough to let them have another season. I'd hate to think <laughs> that we, they got canceled because I showed up and I just talked about Lenore for an hour, uh, some comic nobody buys. So, uh so go to comicsoncomics.com. Also, I mentioned I did the Jordan Jesse Go podcast, episode 79. That's still available. Go ahead and check out Jordan Jesse Go and get my episode with them as we talked about Borscht. And uh, also, I did the Paul Goble podcast uh, with his friend Jim Bruce. Paul Goble and I, uh, we did the show with Jim Bruce. It's Paul Goble and Jim Bruce's show. I showed up and did it. <laughs> uh, so I think, I don't know if it's up yet. It'll be up soon, but uh, I just recorded it Sunday. Uh, but yeah, it's Paul Goble. I, I, and, uh, we talked about Paul's dating life. We talked about a lot of things, but, uh, I, it was a story I forgot to tell Paul, but I'm going to tell on my show because I think it's funny. Uh, Paul Goble was in a improv group called Fancy Ketchup. And, uh, it was him and his friend, Jim Bruce, his best friend, Jim Bruce. I need to point that out because God knows Paul will, uh, <laughs> Tim Bennett and Graham Elwood. And uh, they, I don't know if they did it from college. I don't know the backstory. All I know is they were in Fancy Ketchup and they put on some shows here. And they used to call themselves uh, certain names. Like Tim Bennett would call himself Bug Eye Ketchup. And uh, uh, Paul was Fat Ketchup because Paul was a heavy guy. And uh, so he was, you know, it was kind of just kind of shorthand for Paul Gold, but was Fat Ketchup. Uh, we always called him Paul, but, you know, he was also called Fat Ketchup sometimes. So we go to a play. My wife Karen and I go to a play that Graham Elwood is in. 
and uh, Graham did a fantastic job in this play. And we show up and Paul Goble is there with his then wife, Jill, who's a, just a fantastic uh, uh, lady. So uh, she's there. And uh, uh, actually, uh, Paul wasn't there yet. Jill was there. And uh, Jill turns on to talk to us at the intermission. And, and Karen and I are speaking. And Karen goes, where's fat ketchup? <laughs> and Jill goes, what? And Karen goes, where's fat ketchup tonight? And Jill goes, what are you talking about? She goes, your husband, Paul. And she goes, yeah, Paul is my husband. What did you call him? And Karen goes, fat ketchup. And I'm slack-jawed. I can't believe she did this. I, I'm sitting next to her. My mouth is open. I'm just like, what? Who do you? Th what? Like, his friends might call him that occasionally. Like, it's not. What are you doing? And Jill just goes, my husband's name is Paul. <laughs> and Karen goes, yes, Paul. Is, yes, I know. And Jill just turns around. Like, that's it. The conversation's over. And I, I'm staring at Karen I, I, like she had a fucking, like she was turning into a wolf man. That's how I, I'm just like this weird like face. Like, what? Who does that? And she looks at me like, like almost like get a load of her. Like what she pissed off about. You just called her husband fat ketchup. Who does that? Nobody. <laughs> Unbelievable. So, and again, my wife meant it innocently. She just thought everybody called him fat ketchup, including his family. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it, it made me laugh. I, I forgot to tell it. I, I forgot to tell Paul that the other night, but cause we were talking about, we got to talking about Jill, but, uh, so I'm on the Paul Goble show. I'm on comics on comics. I did Jordan, Jesse go. I'm on the 40-year-old boy. Uh, there's a plug for that. You can get that at iTunes. And also, tomorrow, I'm doing the Dork Forest with Jackie Cation. Uh, Jackie Cation's Dork Forest podcast. Uh, I don't know if that's dorkforest.com. Go to JackieCation.com. I would imagine she's got all the information. Uh, and I'll have it in, a, uh, after I post the communique, I'll, I'll list all the links and everywhere you got to go to go ahead and listen to me and my disembodied voice. Or my embodied voice, as you'll see at the video at the comic book store. Uh, which tapes tonight, but you don't care about that because uh, you won't be there. You'll be listening to this the next day. All right, so. <laughs> so, comicsoncomics.com, jackiecation.com, uh, Paul Goble has his podcast, uh, and also Jordan Jesse Go, and then Mike at MikeSchmidtComedy.com, myspace.com slash Mike Schmidt Comedy. And uh, also, I'll be at a wake in your neighborhood. Just any wake at all. If you If you drive by a funeral home and you hear guffaws of laughter coming out the door, Go ahead and do a hard right into that parking lot because, you know, I am there holding court. <laughs> I am making sure that that guy's trip to the afterlife is hilarious. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, I'm booked. I, actually, I don't, I don't work wakes uh, unsolicited anymore. I got to be booked. You got to book me to work your wake. <laughs> I should just, Lily and I are going to put a bookmeforyourwake.com. <laughs> and, and I'll just show up. And it's for your wake. That you can't, that's the ch thing. You can't book me to work anybody else's wake. You have to book me for your wake. So then you got to prepay, and then when you're dead, I show up and I'm just hilarious. I mean, I, I, that works out great. So we're banking on your death, and you're, we're banking on your death being awesome. That would be a great gig. Like you know, I, I, like you know what I should do? I should come up. You know those murder mystery people who work Christmas parties? I should do that for wakes. How inappropriate would that be? There's just a dead guy and like a you know, you know a guy in a Columbo jacket comes in and goes, "There was a murder here." That would be great. Put on a weird wake show. That's a great idea. That livens up a wake. You know, because an Irish wake, they always have what people are getting bombed all the time, right? You know, and I'm half Irish, so I'm, you know, and I have always wondered that. I'm like, do I want a wake? You know, when, you, when you're a kid, that used to be romantic. You're like, I can't wait till everybody shows up at my funeral. They're going to be sad. And then guess what? You're, you know what made me process that? The death of John Ritter. I know that sounds weird, but John Ritter, when he died, I remember it was this crazy. Everybody's like, oh, my God, I can't believe John Ritter died. And he was rushed to the hospital. And he was he was a guy that we loved. And we loved him in movies. And he was in Three's Company. And he was really good at what he did. Uh, and then I, after, you know, two days, I was driving on the freeway. And I saw his funeral uh, in Burbank or wherever it was. Uh, you know, at the, at that, I, I, the, it's a famous uh, cemetery. But you Forest could, Lawn. Uh, Forest Lawn. You could see it going on. And, uh, and that night on the news, I remember them saying, yeah, uh, you know, John Ritter's funeral was today. And, uh, you know, the, he might have gone into anaphylactic shock or whatever the fuck happened to him. And then they were talking about suing the hospital. And then after the, at the fourth day, nobody cared. 
And that was what made me really kind of, this. it was this sobering thing about death where I went, man, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. You die, you die. And maybe there's an uproar for a day or two and people are sad and upset. But after that, people live. They go on with their life, man. And that's just how it works. And this is the kind of speech you can get from me at your wake for $1,800. How are you not clicking through to bookmeatyourwake.com immediately? You can actually get there through a link at MikePowelskiIsStillDead.com. So that's all it is. It's, a pic, it's Mike's, you know, freshman year photograph from his yearbook, uh, you know, 1966 to 1980. And then underneath there's a link, BookMeFearAwake.com. It's a friend of the MikePowelskiIsStillDead.com site. 28 years later, still kicking Powelski's corpse in the balls. I am not a good person. Uh, all right, I'm out of here. I have to go to Best Buy and sit and wait in line for Chinese democracy to come out. I, uh, <laughs> I'm serious. I cannot. I can't wait for it. And it's what's so ridiculous about it. You know, this album has been what 15 years in the making, wherever the fuck it is. And uh, all these, it's people online are making fun of it, and they're like, "Oh, screw you, Axel. I, I don't care. I care. I can't fucking wait. Axel's the man. That's right. Axel's like El- He's our Elvis." He's just a guy who made, but, you know, Elvis made, he, he, you know, he ripped off black guys and made like 80 albums off their, uh, you know, standing on their shoulders. <laughs> Axel, however, made five albums and then just disappeared into a fucking foil window lined house. Uh, foil lined window house. There you go. Not foil window line, foil lined window. And uh, by the way, it's, uh, it's bookmeforyourwake.com, right? Yeah. Didn't I, is that what I said? I don't know. I, I, in my head, I'm just like, I, I, I'm going to, did I say bookmeatyourwake.com or bookmeforyourwake.com? It's bookmeforyourwake. If you book me at your wake, that's not going to get anywhere because you're dead. I don't know. About, that negotiation does not proceed well at all. I come at you with a counter number. For, you know, I, I, first it's 1,800, and then you're just dead. You lay there. You don't counter at all. So I figure, all right, I'm getting the 1800 Then I go over to somebody who knows you, and I go, hey, this guy offered me, he owes me 1800 bucks for working here. So that's what happens if you book me at your wake. But if you book me for your wake, then we're square. Then you prepay with no refunds. I don't want to hear this bullshit that you died and uh, all your money burned up in the car with you. you. You paid early. I don't care. I'm squared away. Prepay. That's a business. You, de- you definitely have to prepay that business. What's what that? you die? What if I die? Before they die. Again, no refunds. No refunds. <laughs> you can come to my wake and try to get it out of my cold dead hands that's where your refund is your refund is in my pine box going for a fucking uh, dirt sled forever some maggot's gonna eat your money as it climbs into my fucking uh, coffin as it worms its way through my Phillies jersey and eats your money which is in my pocket that's right I'm getting buried in a Phillies jersey for no reason uh, the, the Phillies jersey I want to buy, it's so funny, you can buy them and you can, on the back you can write like a, you know, a name or something and they're all personalized. Uh, you know what fits on the back? World champs. So I was going to get world champs and have the number be 08. God damn it, I want to do it so bad and yet the MasterCard people won't let me. They continue to be furious at me. They're like, no, you can't buy a jersey, dick. You owe us money. And I'm like, really? Just one more purchase, please. And Grant's whole fucking thing's a house of cards anyway. I mean, is is my Phillies jersey going to bankrupt MasterCard forever? That's the whole thing now. At this point, credit has become a death watch. I owe these people so much money, and yet I'm just waiting for them to collapse. It's almost like the end of Fight Club when uh, when, uh, he's going to go in and blow up all the buildings that have all the credit records so we can all start over. I'm excited about this possibility. That's the thing with the economies. I keep hearing American Express is getting money, and Citibank is cutting people, and they're doing all this. I'm like, all right, good, do it. That's fine. Because I owe those guys like 10 grand. I'm like, all right, go under, please. By all means, Citibank. I'm rooting for your demise. I'm rooting for anarchy. Just to get me out from under their, their, the thumb of the credit oppressors. But I get to use my MasterCard this week to buy Chinese democracy. I know, I'm just buying it at this point for the liner notes. I'm buying it, you know what? I'm buying it as a fuck you to people who want to say fuck you to Axel. I'm in Axel's corner, goddammit. Axel just sitting in his house brooding. Right now, waiting waiting for Chinese democracy to drop so he can bankrupt Dr. Pepper. Uh, I think that's brilliant. The fact that he's giving it to Dr. Pepper's like, well, it's just such a random thing. If Chinese democracy ever comes out, we'll give everybody in America a free soda. Done. Like that, I, I'm, You know what? I'm all for Dr. Pepper now because they were the burr in, in Axel's saddle. I don't know if Axel rides a horse. I don't know if he has a saddle. I don't know if he needed a burr. I don't know if Dr. Pepper provided that burr. They, quite frankly, just invalidate the previous three sentences. I have no idea what any of it means. All I know is I'm going to buy Chinese Democracy Sunday. And it's funny because I already have it. 
uh, folks. I'm not going to lie to you. I have what I, th- uh, except for two songs, I have the whole album. And I would use it as my uh, going out music today just to prove to you that I had it. Uh, but I'm not going to because they're putting people in jail for that now. <laughs> There's a guy going to jail for putting Chinese democracy on his website. And uh, good luck surviving prison. <laughs> as, as, you know what? It's so funny. I picture that guy's going to go to prison, and they're going to find out what he's in there for. Like these hardened criminals going to be like, what are you in there for? Oh, you know what? I uh, pirated Chinese democracy and put it on my website. He's going to get raped so much. All you're going to hear out of that prison is the sound of, it's going to sound like the Axel scream at the beginning of Welcome to the Jungle. <laughs> That's what that guy's going to sound like every time he gets raped. Just like that. <laughs> It's, that's, that's all you're going to hear out of the thing. That guy getting welcome to the jungle. <laughs> and believe me, there will be nobody happier than Axel just sitting in his house. He'll have the, a smile on his face. He won't even know why. Just sitting there in the jungle. guy i am not a good guy but i don't think i'm a bad person overall so uh and go ahead and by all means judge that i'm kind of a jag off i got the future what am i talking about but i am a jag off uh, and i'm not a jerk i'm a nice guy it's just i guess i have jerky tendencies i've done so much ridiculous stuff and then i, I wonder afterwards i'm like man how come i don't uh, hang out with anybody here's why because you're a dick Yeah, 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 yeah